Hello and welcome to the Of Interest podcast. I'm Gareth Vaughan from interest.co.nz. In late 2021, in a rare show of bipartisan agreement, the Labour and National Parties teamed up to enact new building intensification rules, enabling the building of up to three homes of up to three storeys on most sites in New Zealand's five largest cities without the need for a resource consent. This came through the Resource Management Enabling Housing Supply and Other Matters Amendment Act and the Medium Density Residential Standards, or MDRS. Doing this would improve housing supply by speeding up implementation of the National Policy Statement on Urban Development, enabling more medium density homes. Housing Minister Megan Woods said this would allow the building of tens of thousands more houses, helping tackle the housing crisis. And National's then Housing and Urban Development spokeswoman, Nicola Willis, said National and Labour were coming together to say an emphatic yes to housing in our backyards. But what does all this really mean? Where's the process at? And is it actually the right thing to be doing? To discuss this, I'm joined by Doug Fairgray. He's director at consulting and economic research firm Market Economics. Hi, Doug, and welcome to the Of Interest podcast. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, hi, Gareth. Good to be here. Look, before we get underway, can you just give us a, a, a quick rundown on you know, what you do um, and perhaps uh, the, the, the key areas you're working at the moment and, and who with? Yeah, sure. I mean, my core discipline is economic geography, um, which is sometimes called spatial economics, and it's basically under, understanding economies and taking into account location, which is especially for cities, is a, is a very important aspect. Um, I do a lot of consulting work to councils and to private firms, and often my work ends up in um, either the Environment Court or Independent Hearing Panel hearings or um, various council hearings. Um, I've been working in this area for, for quite a few years, um, sort of stretching back to, I think, a big study we did in Auckland in the late 70s on th- the spread of... Um, the, the city across the uh, the surrounding uh, lifestyle block lands. Okay. And are you working for any particular councils at the moment? Uh, a number. I'm, I'm doing a lot of work at the moment for Auckland Council. I've been assisting Auckland Council um, in their implementation requirements for the um, the medium density residential standards. And I was the, uh, the chief author of the Section 32 um, economy report uh, when the MDRS changes were introduced last year. Okay, great. So you have uh, you know this issue inside out, so you're, you're a good guest for us to talk about with this. Um, okay, so look, before, you know, I guess let's start with the, the, the basics um, on this. Back in October 2021, when Labour and National made the announcement of new building intensification rules, what problems were they looking to resolve or I guess at least improve? Uh, They're generally looking to increase the enabled supply of housing um, with the expectation or hope that that would then flow through into actually more housing being put on the ground. Um, And the the new legislation would extend uh, the potential for intensification. They already had the National Policy Statement on Urban Development, which uh, focused on centres and areas around um, rapid transit stations where they were looking to intensify housing there and the MDRS provisions uh, would apply to the other residential areas across cities um, beyond these sort of centres-based walkable catchments. So just in terms of, I'm interested in where we're at in this process. Um, have the full changes actually taken effect from the Act and the MDRS um, yet, or is there still a bit more water to, to flow under the bridge? Yeah, there's a reasonable amount of water to, to flow under the bridge, um, as it were. Uh, councils were required to um, introduce or, or notify plan changes in August last year, through which they would implement the new, the new medium density standards. And then there's a, an intended hearing process, which is underway in a number of places now, which will go through uh, until about August this year, so with the intention of having um, the new standards in the existing um, council plans and taking effect from um, about August this year. 
And I mean, in terms of the scale of what's proposed here, it's pretty significant, isn't it? In terms of, you know, three, up to three houses um, of three stories on most sites across Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga, Wellington and Christchurch. So potentially that's a heck of a lot of building. I mean, is is there any, can we quantify just how many how many new dwellings could be built under these rules? Well, it, yeah, I mean, there's the potential for the dwellings to be built, but of course, whether they're actually built or not depends on demand for dwellings. Um, so they've greatly increased what is enabled um, by you know, about two, two times, um, but, well, certainly in Auckland's case, but uh, that doesn't really make, make much difference to the level of demand because people still have to purchase houses, be able to afford them and so on. So one of the effects will be that the, um, the distribution of new housing supply is, is likely to become spread more widely across cities rather than uh, focused around centres and, um, and transit stations as was intended or as is intended under the National Policy Statement work. And, I mean, look, clearly the, the thinking behind what Labour and National came out with was to address a perceived housing shortage. Obviously, we are still constantly hearing about housing crisis, housing problems, whatever you want to, to call it. And obviously, right now, off the back of the flooding in Auckland and Cyclone Gabrielle, there's a lot of people whose homes are destroyed or damaged. And, you know, so this is causing more, more housing pressure in parts of the country. So, I mean, clearly we do have a housing problem in New Zealand. There's also, we've had people living in, or have people living in motels. We've got, last I looked, more than 23,000 applicants on the social housing waiting list. But a question I have here is, do we have a, a housing shortage or do we have a, a shortage of affordable housing? Really, it's a, a shortage of affordable housing. Um, and I say that in relation to the, the the level of activity in the construction sector, which has been going on in the last couple of years. Um, Auckland is currently um, issued around 20,000 consents for new dwellings last year and about the same number the year before. Um, and if all of those come, uh, are actually built, um, that coincides with a time when Auckland's population actually dropped. So to the extent that there has been a housing shortfall in the past, um, a lot of that would be offset by uh, the new dwellings if they come into place over the last couple of years. And it's similar uh, across the country as a whole. But I'm not saying that that completely removes the ha any housing shortage, but the issue is um, it's uh, the number of dwellings that people can afford. Okay. And primarily what we're talking about here in terms of what um, the government's doing through the Resource Management, Enabling Housing Supply and Other Matters Amendment Act, the Medium Density Residential Standards, is loosening planning controls. Now, will that on its own create affordable housing? And, and, and if not, what else do we need to do? Um, on its own, it, it won't. I mean, the, the government, and there's been a strong narrative for the last decade at least, that planning is to blame for high housing prices. Um, and so that's led to a, a focus um, that therefore planning legislation should solve the problem. Um, now, you know, there's, a, there's quite a debate around that because really um, housing prices have been driven above all by, uh, by consumer sentiment and interest rates. And when interest rates are low, housing prices tend to shoot up. When interest rates rise, as they have done in the the recent past, uh, housing prices tend to drop. And that applies right across the country, not just in the major cities. Um, so expecting planning legislation by itself to have a major effect, I think, is, um, uh, is quite a tall task. OK, so, so what else needs to be done? I mean, I think immediately of infrastructure capacity, things like wastewater, stormwater, and obviously capacity or potential capacity constraints in, in construction personnel and price of building materials. We hear about them, them being high a lot. And obviously you've already mentioned how Auckland's population fell, uh, obviously in the in the COVID period. 
Um, but, you know, immigration is on the rise again now, so that's another factor, isn't it, to, to consider? Oh, yes, and, and certainly um, construction costs is, a, is, is important. Um, in the past, we have had quite an influx of overseas purchasing um, in New Zealand. That's been uh, tailed off a lot um, since the regulations, I think, in 2017. But that was a, a major effect uh, prior to that. And also we had shortages in terms of uh, the, cons- the construction sector itself. I mean, the, the effect of the Christchurch earthquake rolled right through the economy in terms of the availability of workforce and that sort of thing. And it's really only since about 2016 that um, Auckland's construction workforce has um, recovered to sort of pre-GFC levels. What about that infrastructure? I mean, in terms of these new uh, medium density residential standards, um, how is that going to tie in with wastewater and stormwater and, 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 and other necessities? Yeah, well, infrastructure is always expensive, so um, it, it's generally very important to get the, make the best use you can of your infrastructure, which generally means not spreading it around. If you, if you keep your infrastructure consolidated and grow incrementally outward and use up the land as intensively as you can in the meantime then your infrastructure costs uh, per dwelling uh, tend to be kept under control, or at least as low as it's possible to get them. The the contrast is that if you uh, free up situations and allow dwellings or dwelling growth to be spread more widely around cities, then that puts greater demands on the infrastructure providers. One other aspect of this is um, I've seen some critics mention is natural justice issues. So I guess we're talking here about if your neighbour decides they're going to put three three-storey houses on the section and it's, you know, close to your fence and blocking your sunlight, etc. Do you have any, any, any? Is there anything you can do about that under the new rules? Um, not as, uh, not as far as I can tell formally, because you can. Um, as I understand it, you can have up to three dwellings uh, without resource consent, but you still need things like building consents and, and so on. Um, uh, but through the appeal process or anything, there's far fewer avenues for that to occur, which tends to mean more of the, uh, the process gets down to um, discussions among neighbours or discussions between existing people and developers and so on. I did notice that um, I mean Christchurch City Council initially were not keen on these proposals and I did notice that they are um, that they're having a um, I think a, a meeting next week and they're going to be consulting on it um, but they have said that the um, MDRS are a legal requirement and have to take effect but they're proposing a, a special citywide restriction called a qualifying matter to with the aim of achieving greater sunlight access for homes um, which will affect new developments um, under the new standards. Is this something that other cities are also doing? Yes, yeah, there's been a lot of interest in the qualifying matters um, and there's a, a range of a, approaches to this. I mean, on one aspect, qualifying matters are ways to, if you like, preserve or uh, look after environmental standards, that sort of thing, which could be impacted by um, higher density. Um, also, there's the issue of um, potentially higher infrastructure costs and I think in Auckland there's the, uh, the issue of special character in terms of the quality or the, um, the appearance of the built environment um, and uh, a council seeking to preserve or protect some areas uh, has to be attra- approached through the qualifying matter approach. Now, we, we noted that this is initially applying to the five biggest cities. So just once again, that's Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga, Wellington and Christchurch. But there's a, an, another series of so-called tier two councils or urban environments sort of waiting in the wings, so to speak. And this is Whangarei, Rotorua, New Plymouth, Napier Hastings, Palmerston North, Nelson Tasman, Queenstown and Dunedin. So what's going to happen with them? Uh I think they they will become subject to the the standards depending on how the, the government um, uh, approaches things. I mean, there there is a timetable, and I understand a timetable in place uh, that uh, 
re- compliance will be required sort of in, at the next level of the uh, the tier two cities. Um, this does, uh, I guess, uh, appears to be perhaps a bit of a, a one size fits all approach um, to residential zones to solve this housing crisis. I'm just wondering, I mean, is there a danger here of perhaps not doing density as well as, as, as we could? I know that in the select committee process when the bill was going through, which was much, much shorter than it, than it normally is, that the, both the Green Party and the ACT Party opposed um, the bill. And one of the criticisms the Greens had was that it was a missed opportunity to create more livable and resilient cities. Just wondering what, what you think of, of the dangers around that. Yeah, I think, I think there's a, a, a clear difference um, and tension between the, uh, the national policy statement on urban development, which is um, looking to focus urban growth um, in a relatively compact form uh, centres-based approach, which generally allows your cities to perform uh, much more efficiently uh, because there's more walkability, there's uh, people are closer to services and jobs and that sort of thing. And there's a real tension between that and the medium density standards which apply across the rest of the cities. Um, and that means um, if the medium density standards create a lot of opportunity, then the, the previous focus on the centres themselves and intensifying around centres and walkable catchments is diluted quite a lot. So that, that's a, a real issue and I think the, um, the submissions to the select committee picked up on that. One of the things that we had in Auckland obviously predating this was the unitary plan which was uh, rolled out in 2016 by Auckland Council. Um, one of the things there was that there were these different zones um, introduced some new ones, I guess, and and there was going to be density allowed in some areas and not others, and there was obviously a lot of debate about that and frustration with among some people, etc. Um, but with the new medium density residential standards, it seems that it's pretty much everywhere is is open to them. I mean, is it? I mean, if we just focus on Auckland for a minute on this, is is any suburb in Auckland um, going to be excused from these, or or could they apply anywhere? They, they're intended to apply just about everywhere it, it, in the urban area. And then there's some questions about which areas are defined as urban and which are not. Um, but um, generally speaking, the, uh, the provisions apply everywhere. And I think, you know, you mentioned the unitary plan. Um, when the unitary plan came in in 2016, after that, uh, the Auckland urban economy started to perform pretty well. Um, you know, we had decrease in housing prices, very slight through to 2019, uh, very strong increase in dwelling consents, and at the same time the Auckland economy was churning along uh, pretty effectively. I mean, Auckland grows faster than the rest of the country and has done f- for a long time and is continuing to do so. So, um, and, and one of the effects is that um, Auckland housing prices have risen more slowly than national average since 2016. Even though they've gone up and down with the, the national trends, uh, the Auckland prices um, and affordability and at the same time housing supply um, has increased a lot. So th- th- there were quite a few pluses or there are quite a few pluses which have come out of the, the unitary plan. And remembering that all the stuff we're seeing at the moment is the result, well not the result, but it's under the unitary plan, um, the national policy statement and the MDRS provisions have not yet kicked in. Um, so we, we're starting from a situation where we're, I think we're rather better off in 2022 um, under the unitary plan uh, than in 2016. Yeah, I mean, the, when the unitary plan um, was introduced, Auckland Council said there was capacity for more than 400,000 new residential homes um, over 30 years, which sounds a, a lot. Um, um, and as you say, um, it does appear that it has had an impact, and I did a previous podcast with Ryan greenaway McGreevy of Auckland University who's done a study, have done, done quite a lot of research on this, and his research suggests that it has improved things, um, even, even in, in the rental market. Um, so I guess this, this, you know, these new MDRS um, rules, I mean, do, do we actually need them? Um, 
Yeah, that's – well, obviously that's a question which is sort of open, I suppose, to debate because it, it tends to become then a, a, a political issue as opposed to a technical issue, and I'm loath to get into the, uh, the politics of anything. Um, but looking at the evidence, you know, th- there's quite a lot of evidence uh, that where plans like the unitary plan were working quite well um, and looking at what some of the effects of the MDRS might be, as distinct from the national policy statement stuff, um, you know, that, that does raise a number of questions. And, and I think getting back to the, the sort of earlier point that seeking, trying to drive um, housing policy and urban policy through planning legislation uh, rather than looking at things like interest rates and um, tax deductibility and so on, some of these more fundamental things, uh, that, that does create a number of challenges. Um, can you sort of elaborate a little on the challenges? Um, well, if you're doing, looking at something like your, your urban policy, which affects a large or affects basically everybody through the country, um, it's really important to get your urban policy right uh, and it's important to understand how our cities and how the urban economies are performing. And there's been a, a number of questions raised, including by myself, as to how well the performance of our urban econos- economies is being understood and what effect that has, has been having on, uh, on policy direction. Um, and I think it's important that we get our understanding of how urban economies work and how land markets work and so on, do we get that in line and get that sorted um, uh, and then use that to, uh, to guide urban policy and especially through things like now through the, the Nat- Natural and Built Environments Bill, which is also coming into place. Now, land values were impacted in, here in Auckland quite significantly by the unitary plan because obviously if you have a, 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 a section where there's capacity to build more houses, the value of your land is higher than someone who's got one where, where they can't or someone who's got a very small section. Um, are these new standards, medium density standards, going to have a similar impact, do you think? Um, well, they'll certainly have some impact, but uh, obviously your land value is driven most, um, mostly by the potential use of the land and the location of the land. Those are the two major drivers. If uh, you have new standards where you can put more dwellings on the land, then you can intensify and that will push the, uh, the inherent land value up. Um, at the same time, that has to be tempered by the size of the total market. Um, you, know, you, you can increase the capacity across many sites, but that each of those sites has a proportionally lower chance of actually being intensified, so the, the market tends to even that out. And because under the unitary plan we had capacity for more dwellings than the expected demand, um, much of the effect of the medium density standards will be to redistribute land value rather than um, push land values up. Um, and, and land value tends to go up, or, or no, when you develop, if you're going to be developing say three dwellings on a site, or adding two dwellings to an existing site, the land value will go up by, by quite a lot because each, each dwelling will need to have its own component of land and so the, the land value, um, partly it's because of the, uh, the size of the, uh, the site but mostly it's because you can put a dwelling on it. It's the potential use. Um, so yes, you'll get where development actually occurs, the value of those sites will go up. Uh, in other places where there's less chance of it happening, that have little effect on, on the value of the land. Now, we've obviously had a lot of extreme weather events this summer. Um, obviously, the flooding in Auckland and you know other parts of um, the North Island, Northland, Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Waikato, then Cyclone Gabriel rolled through and has obviously done a lot of damage, particularly particularly down the east coast around Gisborne and Hawke's Bay. Um, just wondering in terms of the medium density residential standards, um, what 
might they mean in terms of helping um, housing and sections cope with extreme wind and, and rain? I mean, is there going to be less scope for green space? And what about drainage? Are there any particular issues you see around that? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the uh, – there's a number of issues. One and uh, is that um, the more dwellings you build, uh, generally the greater the level of immediately impervious surface in terms of roofs and so on. So that has an impact on runoff. Um, so uh, denser development can mean, doesn't automatically, but can mean uh, during a, a weather event you get more runoff which has flow on or down, downstream effects. Um, also I think uh, there's going to be a lot more interest in um, the safety or the suitability of sites. I mean there's, there's been a general push around the country to anticipate um, sea level rise and we're looking at things like managed retreat. Uh, and exactly the same thing happens um, in cities where the, the lower lying areas tend to be at more risk. And a number of the, if you like, the, the qualifying matters of councils around the country um, have sought, or I understand, are seeking to be able to continue to take these things into account uh, when um, consenting goes on. Because that that's, has been the practice for a long time uh, across councils um, because councils have, uh, if you like, a wider duty of care in terms of where they enable consenting to a go and um, you know, not direct things away from the higher risk areas but perhaps discourage development in the uh, higher risk areas. Do you, do you think we need to have, and I mean uh, to some extent I guess we already are, ha given recent weather events, having a bit of a conversation around some areas where we have built and perhaps whether we should rebuild there or actually just, as you say, you know, have a managed retreat from some areas. And perhaps with some of these areas where we may get more density, do we need to really consider whether even being there at all is appropriate? Oh, well, yes, certainly. I mean, you've got to look at the, the suitability of the geography of where you're building. And part of that is the, the direct risk, but also part of that is the ability of your infrastructure to minimise or reduce that risk in terms of stormwater drainage and, and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, I think uh, Cyclone Gabrielle especially is, is going to cause uh, a greater focus on that. And I think, you know, this is going to be a, a sort of quite, a, quite a wide discussion around uh, not just councils, but also things like the insurance sector and, you know, whether you can get your, uh, get your dwelling insured is an important uh, important consideration. Well look um, Doug, that's um, it's really fascinating and it's going to be interesting watching all this as things roll out and as the process continues. That is Doug Fairgray who's Director at Consulting and Economic Research Firm Market Economics and I'm Gareth Vaughan from interest.co.nz with another episode of our Of Interest podcast. Thanks Gareth. Thank you. Thank you.